Hello, my name is Jean Sealand, and I am the Youth Program Coordinator for the Volunteer Center of Cedar Valley. We are located in Waterloo. As such, my job is to work with young people in area schools and with after school programs to develop service learning programs. Our center celebrated our 25th year of existence last year, and we continue to grow and reach out to more and more people. Our vision is to mobilize people and resources to deliver creative solutions to our community problems. And a component of that vision is our service learning outreach. I'm a product of the 1960s. Uh, I'm, I know I'm giving away my age, but as a young impressionable child, I heard John F. Kennedy say, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I took this message to heart. I had a wonderful career in teaching, helping young people reach their potential, and now I have a great job at the Volunteer Center of Cedar Valley, helping young people give back to the community. I absolutely love books. And a favorite quote of mine is from the anthropologist, Margaret Mead. She said, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Another favorite quote of mine is from a book written by Dr. Seuss, The Lorax. And that quote is, unless someone like you does a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better, it's not. Now, I'm a believer in young people. I believe young people have the power to create a culture of change that can make the world a better place. I found some research that shows youth 12 to 18 as certain psychological factors that will make them great actors. And I'd like to share those factors with you. And I'm sure that many of you can identify these factors in yourself. The first factor is identity. You are now developing your personal narratives. You are deciding what you will accept and what you will stand for in your lives. Another factor is group inclusion. You have the need to feel connected to and accepted by each other. Another factor is, and you can check like this one if you want, rebellious testing of limits. How far can you go and not get into trouble? How many of you have experienced that? Another factor is expression. You have a lot of emotion and passion and you want to give it a voice. <coughs> Excuse me. The last factor is intellectual growth. Your brains are capable of far greater thinking than ever before. Today, we're going to explore the topic of service learning. We'll learn the definition, the benefits, and why we should engage in service learning. We'll, we will also explore how to begin a service learning project and the steps of service learning then we're actually going to work through a service learning project. And at the end of the session, I really hope that you feel that you have the tools needed to begin your own service learning project. First of all, let's start with the definition. Service learning is a research-based strategy for promoting high student achievement while providing students with opportunities to use newly acquired academic skills and knowledge of real life situations. Basically, service learning allows for meaningful learning opportunities for young people through contributions to the community. Now, service learning isn't a new concept at all. In the early 1900s, John Dewey, who some people consider the father of modern uh, education, uh, stress the importance of learning by doing. He never used the term service learning, but he was an advocate for learning by solving real life problems. Now, a service learning project can meet your community needs, can be integrated into an academic curriculum. It can enhance 
anything that is taught in school. <clears throat> it can provide you with opportunities to use newly acquired academic skills and knowledge of real life situations. It can help foster the development of a sense of caring for others. More specifically, service learning can help you gain a better understanding of diverse cultures and communities. It can connect you with the members of your community. You're gonna learn more about social issues, but also the root causes of these social issues. A good example of this is food drives for food are really, really popular in our schools. But do we really understand the root causes of hunger? Well, food drives are absolutely wonderful. Don't get me wrong. It's, they're absolutely wonderful. But let's go a bit deeper and really examine what the root causes are and maybe we can do step something to help stop the hunger. Service learning will help you develop strong leadership, collaboration and communication skills. It's going to give you a chance to act on a belief or a value that you might have. This one I think is so important. It's gonna make you realize you can make a difference no matter who you are, how young you are, how old you are, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, uh, whether you are athletic, or whether you are non-athletic, you can make a difference. And it's also gonna help you gain some confidence in your skills and abilities. You're gonna develop some real critical thinking skills in real life situation. Plus it's gonna have the added benefit if you work with others to develop some strong camaraderie with your peers. Now, service learning can basically be divided into three different types, or I like to, I, I, I like to use these three different types of service learning. The one is direct service. And that's when you would go and you would sort food at the food bank, or you would serve lunch at the Salvation Army. It's really a hands-on approach and you're out there in the community and you're doing something. It's a little bit hard to do right now because of the pandemic. Hopefully in a while, we'll be able to go back to doing those very, very things. Now, indirect service is something that you can do at home or you can do it in the classroom or you can do it at a 4-H meeting or wherever you may be. Uh, examples of this might be collecting socks for the homeless and then taking them to a homeless shelter or perhaps making some casseroles and then delivering them to uh, a homeless shelter or the Catholic worker house or someplace like that for people to eat or something fun like making cat toys or dog toys for the Humane Society. And the third type of service learning is called advocacy. Now advocacy is working for a cause in a variety of ways. Perhaps you decide to write letters to the editor about global warming. Perhaps you put together a PowerPoint to teach younger children in schools about bullying. Or perhaps you make a PowerPoint and you go to a city council meeting and you explain why an area of your town needs sidewalk. As I said, in this time of COVID, it makes sense to maybe concentrate on the indirect and the advocacy methods of service learning. Now, I'm going to create some scenarios for you, okay? And if you have a piece of paper, you can jot down your answers to these, okay? Uh, this is just to get your thought processes going a little bit. Uh, and not looking so boring for you, okay? Uh, let's say that you decided to do a service project on animal abuse. And you did a bit of research and you found out that five to seven million animals enter shelters every year. And that the shelter has to pay about $235 for a year's worth of food for a dog and about $115 for a year's worth of food for a cat. 
would be a possible project. Jot down some possible projects that you could do. You know, you could just basically do a drive for cat and dog food to a local shelter, or you could create a advocacy campaign, um, putting posters up over the town, uh, telling people to adopt pets from the shelter. Or you could do a blanket or a towel drive uh, for the shelter to use in the cages. Let's decide you want to do a project on the issue of hunger. After you've done some research, which is always important because this is service learning, so we need to learn from this. But after doing the research, we find that in the United States, 45 million people live on the brink of hunger. And that some people really don't know where their next meal is going to come from. And that worldwide, close to a billion people are hungry. And about 16,000 children die every day of hunger. What could you do? Well, the obvious thing is to collect food for a food bank. You could find out if you have a community garden or you could start a community garden for food to be given to a food bank. You, if you wanted to do something globally, you could give to, you could raise money and uh, purchase animals or bees or seeds through the heifer project, something like that. These are all possible service learning projects that you could do. So now we come to the very essence of our discussion. How do we begin? Again, on that sheet of paper that I hope you have, or you can just do it mentally, um, I want you to think of some brief answers to these questions, okay? What issues interest you? Another way to look at this is, if you could change anything for the better, what would it be? Next question. What do you like to do? What are your talents? Are you good at speaking? Are you good at drama? Are you good at athletics? Are you good at listening? What are the special skills that you have? An interesting way to look at this to help you develop what your assets are, think about if someone close to you had to write an introduction for you, what would that introduction say? Think about what your assets are, what your talents are. The next thing I want you to think about is what might benefit the most people? And then what might make the biggest difference? Now be really careful here, especially if you're doing this in a group. We're always going to have naysayers that say, oh, it's not going to make a difference. But you need to know, you need to be confident that in some small way, it really will make a difference. And remember, even if you just change the mind or the life or the situation of one person, it's really, really worth it. But then you also need to think what's really possible. And then this is probably very, very important. What do you have time to do? We have to be realistic about this too. Now the answers to these questions will help you develop what project you want to do. Now, let's look at the steps of service learning. What do we do? The first step is mapping the community. First of all, define what your community is. When I used to teach first grade, we'd learn about communities. And my definition for my first graders is the same definition I'm going to give to you. A community is someplace where you live or work. 
So your community could be your school. Your community could be your city. It could be your county. It could be your state. I caution you not to go too much bigger than that. I always tell the students I work with in service learning, you know, we know that there are a lot of problems in Chicago, but we don't live in Chicago. So we really can't affect much of a change. The place where we're going to affect change is in our own community. Now, to map our community, we need to actually ish list the issues in our community. And I like to do sort of a T chart. I draw a line down the middle of a page and at the top on one side of that line, I put positive. And on the other side of that line, I'll put issues or concerns. I think it's always important that we talk about what the strengths are of a community before we start looking at the issues. It's all too easy for us to only concentrate on what is negative in our community. We have to all realize that every community, every community has so many, so many strengths. And I, I think listing about five strengths is a, a good thing to do. Uh, it, it reassures us that not all is lost in our community. And after we have listed the strengths of our community, the positive things about our community, then let's list the issues that concern us, okay? And think about the community you've decided on, whether it's school or, or whether it's your hometown. If it's your hometown, most of our lists are going to come um, have the issues of homelessness, poverty, hunger, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, probably diversity, probably racism, maybe child abuse, healthcare, social justice, and the environment. Now, some of those can be um, grouped together perhaps, and that's what you'll do after you list them out. But I always think it's so important to just do some brainstorming when, during this phase of it. Let's get all of the issues out there, okay? Now, the second step, is selecting a problem. And after you've made a list of the issues, you need to thoughtfully select an issue for the project. And let's say, let's just imagine that we're going to do a service learning project on a social justice theme. Now, that is really, a really a wide area. And so we need to narrow it down a bit. For our purposes today, for this discussion, let's agree that we want to do a social justice project on the issue of racism. Again, we probably need to narrow it down just a bit more. So let's assume that as a group, we've taken quite a bit of time and we've discussed this and we really decide we want to focus on the economic disparity between people of color and the white population in the community. Now, we need to do some research on this topic. We can't just assume we know what the problems are. But let's think about how are we going to find out this information? Are there agencies in the community that will help us learn about this problem? Well, let's see. If I were going to do this in Waterloo, I would probably go to the Waterloo Human Rights Commission to see what information they had. I would probably call them up or I would email them and I would ask them some, some questions about this issue. I would probably also go to my local chamber of commerce and find out information on minority owned businesses in the community. And we also might want to interview the mayor and members of the city council to gain some more information. Now, our next step is training and orientation. 
we may wish to choose to work with one, to work with our local chamber of commerce on this. Let's find out a bit more about minority owned businesses in the community so we can effectively plan a project. We may wish to interview some key people in the chamber to find out more information and to know how to proceed. Now let's assume that we've got lots of information, okay? Let's plan the project. And I would suggest that we are very, very methodical about doing this, okay? First of all, we need to decide what our goals are with this project. What do we really, really want to accomplish by doing this? Let's say we write a goal, our first goal, is to produce a list of minority owned businesses in our community. That's our first goal. We just wanna have a list of them. But we're going to have a second goal. And in our second goal, we're going to create some kind of a marketing plan to encourage people to support these businesses. So we have two goals for our project. Step two. What are our action steps we need to take to achieve these two goals? Well, first of all, step one would be to create a list of all the minority owned businesses in the community. Step two would be to construct some arguments about the value of supporting minority owned businesses. Step three might be to develop a presentation to the city council and the local chamber with all of this information and ask for some buy-in of your project. And the last step might be, after we've done all this, is to also write some editorials to the local media and explain our project. Let's get some press on, okay? Also involved in the planning process, we need to consider what resources we need. Well, for this project, we probably don't need any funds, which is good. Uh, we just need to have some access to phones and to some computers. Step four in this process is the timeline. We need to determine when we're going to start this and we need to have an end date, and we need to stick to that. Now, the next step after all this research and planning is really meaningful action. Let's do it. Let's do our action steps. This is going to be the actual, actual experience. And I'm hoping that the experience, whatever you experience will be meaningful and well-planned. After we have done our action, we need to reflect upon what we have done. This is where our critical thinking skills will come in to determine what we have learned from this experience. We need to think about what went well, what improvements could we make, how did this help our community, and also, how did I feel about the process and the impact? Sometimes when I'm working with classes on service learning, I just make sort of a four square. And in the first square, I put what? Meaning, what did I do? I describe the project. And the next square, I put why? Why did I do it? What impact did it have? And the next square is fairly open-ended. I put, I learned. What did I really learn from this? And in the last square, I titled questions. And I list any questions I might have. And after we've done our reflection, our step is, the next step is evaluation. Let's evaluate our project that we did and let's, evaluate our own learning and what impact we really had in our community. 
the last step is to celebrate and recognize what we've done, okay? And I hope in your service learning project, you are celebrated and recognized by people in your community and by your teachers in your schools for your, all your efforts and what you have done. That is sort of a um, really, really brief version of how to do a service learning project. I have to tell you that I hope your service learning projects bring you great rewards. When I say great rewards, I don't mean monetary rewards or anything like that, but rewards to you as a person and that you know that you have succeeded in making life better for some segment of your community. So all I can say is good luck to you and I wish you the best. Thank you for being good listeners. <laughs>